Funding for this edition of State of Affairs with Steve Adubato has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting reimagined child care. New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, PNC, Grow Up Great, Holy Name Medical Center, This Place is Different, Choose New Jersey, TD Bank, Rowan University, and by Operating Engineers, Local 825. Promotional support provided by AM970, The Answer. And by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. I'm Steve Arabato. Welcome to another compelling program talking about uh, the issues that matter most to you. I'm going to kick off the program with uh, Tara Colton, who is Executive Vice President for Special Projects at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Tara, great to have you with us for the first time. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Well, Tara, let me jump into this whole question of child care. We're involved in an initiative um, called Reimagine Child Care. You have said, um, and it's an interesting quote, child care has finally been recognized and acknowledged as a vital part of our economic fabric. What does that mean? I think quite simply, if you look, pat, look back on the past year and a half, if this didn't convince you that childcare was critical to our economic stability, success, and forward momentum, I don't know what will. Um, just thinking about the um, fragility of how working families are able to sustain and support their, their lifestyles, their, their commuting patterns, and their work needs, child care is really at the core of it. And um, child care as an economic enabler for both the workers in that sector as a substantial employer in New Jersey, but also child care as something that enables families and parents to go to work, go back to work, look for work, attend school, attend training. Without it, it really, um, I think, is impactful. And you can see that in a lot of the data and trends uh, that have come out recently about working parents, especially working mothers, leaving the workforce. Well, let's talk about the EDA, the Economic Development Authority. Um, what, what is the EDA's role as it relates to child care? Because it's the job of the EDA, if I'm not mistaken, is to stimulate economic activity in the state. Connect that to childcare with the EDA. Sure. So the the you know the mantra from Governor Murphy has been a stronger, fairer economy for all New Jerseyans. And I think we can now add to that a more resilient economy. And what's become so apparent is that without a sustainable and um, and sort of well structured, well funded child care sector, the, again, the workers in the state will struggle, um, but also businesses will struggle to attract and retain the staff that they need if they don't have a safe, high quality place to, to send their kids during the day. I can, as a working mom of, with two little kids, I can certainly speak to that from personal experience. How old and are your children? I have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old. So this is great. Good. I'm sorry. No, they've been in home-based child care. They've been in center-based child care um, since they were three months old. And as a working mom, it has been vital to my ability to, you know, succeed in my career and and um, and you know support our family. So it's been uh, it's been crucial for, for me personally, and that that's partly why I feel so passionate about this. But I also think that the just sort of the economic trends and values are so stark that this is uh, kind of a no-brainer when you think about how critical it is for supporting um, supporting businesses. And so that's what we've been trying to do at the EDA is to think about how childcare 
businesses, even though many of the child care providers in the state don't necessarily consider themselves businesses. They got into this because they love taking care of kids and, and they're good at it, or maybe they had small kids of their own. Um, and so what we're trying to do is support them to both build their business acumen and avail themselves of resources that are, um, that are available throughout the state, but also to think through in the longer term, what are some smart investments that could be made to shore up the child care sector? You know, it's interesting. The, the EDA, the Economic Development Authority, is one of our partners in, in an innovation initiative we're involved in, in about innovation. Now, you may ask, what the heck does that have to do with child care? It's because when we use the term innovation, or it's called the innovation state, if you will, a lot of it's about technology, the biotech sector, um, et cetera, et cetera. But connect innovation to innovation in the world of child care. A, how much has it innovated and evolved, and B, what does it need to do to innovate moving forward? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I think the, the state of um, providing child care and really the focus of a lot of, you know, under Governor Murphy's leadership and our Department of Human Services, Department of Children and Families, they've really focused on both innovations around curriculum and, and early childhood education, but also on raising the bar when it comes to quality. And so um, there's a system called Grow New Jersey Kids, which allows providers to um, enter into a rating system. And if they receive higher ratings, based on certain objective criteria, they're able to receive higher uh, payments through the state's subsidy system if they enroll low-income children. And so one of the areas where we're recognizing there's a gap is that there are many child care providers who would love to be able to advance within that system, but they don't have the resources to make some of the improvements that are needed in their facilities to then be able to qualify for that higher rating and ultimately that greater level of revenue. So a big part of what we're trying to do is um, raise the bar for the quality of care for every kid in the state, but also to think about long term, what are some smart ways to sustain the sector and maybe do business a little differently, whether that's sharing um, uh, sort of back office administrative functions or thinking about new ways to support how providers are paid for child care services, um, support to families. I think that there's a lot of ways to um, strengthen and really, frankly, uh, increase the amount of respect and professionalism that is bestowed upon the sector, which it has always deserved. I think it's just been during the past year that it's finally taken on the energy and focus that it long deserved. Carrie, okay, i got a minute left. I want to ask you about this. We have interviewed the First Lady. By the way, we're taping on the 22nd of June. We've interviewed the First Lady, Tammy Murphy, um, about the Nurture NJ initiative. Remind folks what it is and what the EDA's connection to it is. Sure. So the Nurture New Jersey, Nurture NJ initiative um, led by First, First Lady Murphy is really an extraordinary uh, cross-agency collaborative approach to combat uh, New Jersey's frankly, abysmal uh, rates of maternal and infant mortality and the racial disparities that exist within our system. So knowing that black women in the state are significantly more likely to die during childbirth than white women, um, black infants are significantly more likely to die within their first year of life. And so the First Lady has, has convened this incredible coalition of stakeholders, providers, mothers, caregivers, to come up with a set of recommendations about how to really um, improve that and make New Jersey the safest and, and best place in the state to have, you know, have a baby and raise a child. EDA has been involved in that uh, on a number of forms, but one of the areas where we've really been thrilled to partner with the First Lady has been um, to, uh, to enact the um, establishment of a Trenton-based research, innovation, and healthcare center that would be focused on maternal and infant health, right. particularly around racial disparities. And so that's been something that EDA has been helping lead the charge on. Tara Colton from the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. We thank you so much for joining us, Tara. Thank you for having me. You got it. I'm Steve Adubato. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Folks, this is a special edition of State of Affairs on News 12 Plus. We're joined by uh, Tara Colton, Executive Vice President for Special Projects at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Um, Tara, thank you for, first for joining us, but I also want to follow up on this. You told us in a previous interview that there's a Trenton Center 
what is the Trenton Center that you and the EDA are involved in, and why is it connected to innovation, child care, maternal health, et cetera, et cetera? Great. Well, really thrilled to be able to talk about this. Essentially, the, the vision is to establish a center in Trenton, in the state capital, that will provide a host of services to mothers and families um, throughout the state, but will also serve as a catalyst for innovation and research. So essentially, we want to establish um, a place that would be the hub of the First Lady Murphy's Nurture New Jersey initiative that would provide healthcare services, um, serve as a, a resource for training and um, workforce development for caregivers within the field of, um, of prenatal and perinatal care, and then also really serve um, to catalyze innovation uh, particularly focused on the racial disparities in maternal and infant mortality within, um, within the, the country and the world, and, um, and really you know, harness the resources of the state capital while also providing uh, services to local residents. Well said. By the way, I want to thank the, um, the sponsors. Uh, the EDA has folks who support them. We do as well. The EDA is one of our uh, partners as well. But uh, I want to thank the Terrell Fund and the Reimagined Child Care Initiative, which we've spoken to Tara about extensively, uh, the New Jersey Sharing Network, totally engaged and committed to organ and tissue donation. We're involved in a public awareness initiative around that um, very important effort. The Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey and Holy Name Medical Center. Um, before I let you go, real quick on this, 30 seconds on the EDA and why it matters so much. Go ahead, Tara, go. So the EDA works to, to embody Governor Murphy's mantra of a stronger, fairer, more resilient economy. And what that means is um, unlocking opportunity, investment, resources in New Jersey's people, in its communities, in businesses, large and small, and fostering innovation. Terry, I want to thank you and also Tim Sullivan, the team at the New Jersey Economic Development Authority. Um, we thank you so much. Thank you, Tara. All the best to you and your folks uh, at the EDA. I'm Steve Adubato. This has been State of Affairs on News 12 Plus. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. Welcome back, folks. It has been too long, way too long, but he's back by popular demand, State Assemblyman Herb. Conaway Jr., uh, the chair of the Assembly Health Committee, also a physician, one of the, I think, I, Herb, are you the only one? I think I'm the only one. That's right. You're the only one. Hey, Herb, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. And nice I'm only calling you. the Assemblyman and Dr. Conaway Herb because we go back too long. Wow. Uh, hey, let, let me jump into this. You have so many um, issues, health-related issues that you and your colleagues are dealing with. But as it relates to issues of racial disparity regarding health outcomes, what has COVID taught us to date as we tape at the end of June? And what do we need to do more importantly moving forward to close that gap? Well, the pandemic has brought the uh, health disparities, which have always been uh, there, uh, into sharp relief. Uh, when you look at the statistics on who uh, became ill, who died of COVID, who um, uh, was getting vaccinated um, uh, for COVID, or rather against COVID, uh, you see that there are disparities, uh, again, racial disparities that have always been there, but because of the glaring light of pandemic uh, has brought these issues to light and has uh, rightly uh, caused um, uh, government officials uh, and healthcare officials, public health officials to um, pay more attention to the issue and to take steps to address it. You know, uh, let's deal with the vaccine issue. I, I, my sense is all kinds of people come to you, black, white, Hispanic, other, they ask all million questions about the vaccine. Um, the vaccine resistance in the African-American community, how have you taken that on directly? Well, to tell a personal story, uh, I've been vaccinated, my children have been vaccinated. And, um, you know, fortunately, while um, we've had some uh, uh, side effects from the vaccine, which are expected, you're, you know, if you get a tetanus shot, you get arm pain. Uh, if you have uh, get the flu shot, occasionally you feel, you know, unwell for a couple of days, but you have the peace of mind of knowing that you're now protected against uh, the likelihood, or I shouldn't say the likelihood, but the possibility of death uh, from COVID. And so uh, I tell people, 
uh, if you want to be there for uh, your child's wedding, if you want to be there uh, just to enjoy life, if you um, want to be part of the solution and stopping the spread of this disease, then you should get vaccinated. It is a safe vaccine. They're highly effective, and you'll be doing a good thing not only for yourself and your family, but for, but for your state and nation, indeed, as well. You know, Herb, it's so funny you say this. We're actually, my wife and I are going to a wedding with our kids at the end of this week, and, and it's a close friend, but go back when we were kids, growing up in the old neighborhood, and he's not vaccinated, his wife's not vaccinated, their kids aren't vaccinated. When I pushed him, I'm not gonna say his name because people might figure it out. Um, he's like, no, it's, it's my right. And the quote, government's not gonna tell me what to do. And we got into a heated argument about it because he's having 300 people at a wedding. Is it someone's right to say, no, you don't tell me what to do. This is my right not to get vaccinated, but have 300 people at a wedding. Well, it is your right to say no, but it's also, um well within the government's responsibility to take measures uh, in response to your refusal to vaccinate. We do this in the um, vaccination program for school-aged children. Uh, you have a right not to vaccinate your child, but the government and society uh, also has the right and the responsibility to say, then your children need to be excluded from school. Um, you, employers, um, you have a right not to get vaccinated, but employers, particularly private employers, can say, you know, you're a threat to my workforce. Uh, we, uh, we've we already had a tough time dealing with this pandemic. You uh, bring a risk of exposure to a workforce, which could make the pandemic uh, as to our small business even worse. And so I have a right to exclude you from work and ask you to seek other employment. So uh, as long as people are a a willing to face the consequences of those decisions, uh, whether it be uh, to their um, schooling or to their job, or if they're willing to live with the fact that they're infecting other people, um, uh, quite frankly, uh, then uh, then, uh, go ahead and, and not get vaccinated, but I think it's it's ill-advised. We we agree on that, and um, hopefully, with constant reassurance and um, uh, I would say um, kind reinforcement of the need to get vaccinated, people. Yeah, I need to be kinder to it. friends who are resisting. <laughs> I always say, listen, you have a choice to make that decision, but don't think that it doesn't just affect you. But that, I'm not a physician. He is. Uh, uh, Dr. Assemblyman Conaway Herb, let me ask you this. Resolu- Assembly Resolution 212, I know it has to do with the New Jersey Sharing Network, and we're very, and they are involved, and in, they lead the effort in organ and tissue donation, and we are very actively involved in a public awareness initiative around organ and tissue donation. What is Assembly Resolution 212, and why does it matter so much to the organ and tissue um, donation community? Well, the New Jersey Sharing Network here in New Jersey over the last 30 years have have saved more than 15,000 people, have enhanced their lives, and we want them to continue to do that. They have been able to increase uh, the uh, their procurement of organs uh, over that period of time. And unfortunately, the Trump administration uh, at the time was pursuing policies which might have shut down half of the operations in the country, uh, depriving people of, uh, of life-saving tissues and organs. And we thought it appropriate, um, working with the organ procurement organizations, particularly New Jersey Sharing Network uh, and others in the legislature, to say to the Trump administration, uh, don't move forward with these rules which can imperil uh, lives that could otherwise be well, saved. Well, explain again, Herm, what are the rules of the previous administration and how do they affect organ and tissue donation? Well, they were changing some of the reporting rules uh, that would have uh, made it very difficult for the organ procurement operators to, to, in fact, procure organs and distribute them to people who needed them. The, um, th- we believe that the uh, policy thrust by the Trump administration was in contravention of law um, and expressed that uh, to the Congress and by resolution. Uh, Fortunately, um, uh, that policy is now uh, not going to uh, be put in place. And the the business of saving lives through uh, tissue and organ donation will continue and hopefully grow uh, in the years to come. Okay. As the chair of the Assembly um, Health Committee, let me ask you this. Top three issues in 2021 into 2022 other than continuing to deal with COVID are? Well, I will mention COVID. We need uh, to uh, make sure that we understand all that happened. One of the things that uh, this pandemic exposed is that we are not as prepared as we might have been. And that's not only New Jersey. This is, the, this is nationally. Uh, and so we need to put uh, de- to debrief what's happened and begin to plan uh, to prepare for the next uh, pandemic. We need, uh, going forward uh, in the uh, coming year, to deal with this question of, of racial disparity around health care. We know that it exists. We've taken a number of measures in, in terms of telehealth, uh, providing a means for um, uh, for hospitals to partner 
to develop housing. Housing means stability for individuals in the population area of housing, of, uh, of the hospitals that will allow the provision of health care, education, job training, uh, transportation uh, to and from doctor's appointments that will enhance the lives of people who have unfortunately uh, done without. And I think uh, going forward too, we need to um, understand uh, data. Uh, and acquire as much data as we can in the healthcare space, indeed all space, but particularly in the healthcare space, because that needs uh, to drive policy. It has been driving policy, but we know that we can improve um, our, um, our ability to capture and manage data and use it uh, for uh, the, the uh, popular good. Thank you, Assemblyman. Dr. Herb Conaway, the chair of the Assembly Health Committee. Um, thank you so much, Herb. We look forward to having you back again real soon. I'm looking forward to it myself. Uh, be well and stay well. Same to you. I'm Steve Adubato. We'll be right back. To watch more State of Affairs with Steve Adubato, find us online and follow us on social media. We're now joined by the mayor of the second largest and most populated city in the great state of New Jersey, Steve Phillip. Hey, Mayor, how you doing? Good. Good to see you, Steve. Good to be back on. Yeah, Mayor Baraka and Newark um, asked me to just introduce you that way. Is that okay? Obviously, I'm not surprised, but we'll see when the census comes out at the end of August. <laughs> oh, yeah. By the way, we're taping on the 22nd of June. I may have outdated myself in a lot of ways right there. Hey, um, Mayor, help us understand this. Um, right now, jump into COVID. We'll do economic development in a second. Right now, as we do this program, if I'm not mistaken, 46% of the people in Hudson County are fully vaccinated. What does that mean, A, in Jersey City, a part of Hudson County? in terms of a whole range of things, economic issues, school issues, business, et cetera. Talk to us, Mayor. Yeah, I mean, we're over 50% here in Jersey City. Uh, our team has done a really good job. Uh, you see businesses obviously reopening, not only reopening, but you know, being filled to capacity at restaurants, which is nice. Um, and you see senior events getting back together, recreation events happening. So it's going to be a great summer, I think. And uh, we're just going to continue on the path of uh, educating people, but also getting back to some degree of normalcy. Economics. It's interesting. Um, the Biden administration selected Jersey City to participate in what's called local foods, local places. What is it and why does it matter? Yeah, I mean, it's about solving for food deserts. So, you know, similar to Newark or Camden or Patterson, you have big gaps between who has access to what kind of foods. And so, you know, the Biden administration is looking to bridge that divide. And uh, we were selected as one of those cities. So we've done a lot about, you know, food options and, and outreach, and we're just going to continue to do that. L let me try this. Journal Square. For those who don't know what Journal Square is, for all the years I've going in, coming out of the path right to Journal Square, not everyone's done that. And it's evolved over time. What is Journal Square in Jersey City? A, B, what's going on there that matters not just to Jersey City, but the economy of this region? Yeah, so I, uh, Journal Square once upon a time was kind of the heart of the city. It's going to be the heart of the city again. We have huge amount of development there. So I think 13,000 units under construction. But it's more than just uh, residential development. We have uh, some major cultural uh, and entertainment venues happening. So we have the Lowe's Theater, which is a 3,000 seat wonder theater that was born in 1929. That's a partnership with the New Jersey Devils to be open in 2025. Um, it'll be a huge venue in the New York market. And then we have the uh, Centre Pompidou, which is one of the more significant museums in the world, um, coming from Paris and opening a satellite location in Jersey City. So we'll be joining Brussels, Shanghai, and, and of course, Paris as locations that'll showcase some of the greatest art that was ever created. You yeah, go back, I, when I, surf, I saw that on NJ Spotlight News, the yeah. story about, uh, it's the Pompano, I'm gonna say it right, Pompano. Pompidou. Pompidou, I apologize, the Pompidou Center. How the heck does Jersey City get connected to Brussels and all these other international cities? I mean, a couple years ago, we acquired a building on top of the Journal Square path, and it was slated for residential development. And I thought it just had an opportunity to really be something special on a cultural front because it, it's on top of mass transit. It's got really good bone structure. It's in the New York media market. I thought Jersey City had a good story to tell. So we started down the road of finding potential partners. People were skeptical whether we would actually be able to exercise what I actually uh, articulated at the time. But, you know, we, we've outperformed. We've done more than uh, 
we initially expected, and I think that anybody expected, it'll be one of the largest uh, and most significant satellite museums in the country, and it'll be uh, bringing hundreds of thousands of people to Jersey City on the tourism front per year. Steve, let me ask you, uh, as mayor of Jersey City, I don't think people understand, <coughs> excuse me, exact, exactly what a mayor, the mayor's job is, and Jersey City is no small city. As, as you, you talked about, it may become at some point the most populated city in the state. Is there a so-called typical day in your life as mayor? No, you know, the, the, first of all, I love this job. I think it's the best job in government or politics because you're close to residents and you have an opportunity to really make meaningful change, which you don't really have <clears throat> at different levels of government. So every day is different. We're dealing with, you know, some real tough things, whether it be a mass shooting or a regular shooting or a fire issue uh, to the pandemic, to healthy diets, as we said earlier, to recreation programs, to thinking about what the city is going to be in 10, 15, 20 years from now. So every day is different. It kind of keeps you on its toes, but it's really the best job and one that I'm really thankful that people have given me the opportunity to do. Yeah, it's interesting. You talk about crime, um, you know, a horrific incident in Jersey City, but I want to connect it to the larger question of crime. So economic development, economic activity, it's not commentary or analysis. It's just a fact that is, is tied in many ways to people's perception of safety uh, or how safe they are or are not. So here's my question. What are your views, Mayor, of those who argue um, as it relates to the issues connected to police interactions with the minority community, which have been well documented and, and clearly police reform is long overdue? Defunding the police, what does that mean to you and what are your thoughts on it? I mean, look, we've been vocal from the beginning that, you know, we're not going to defund our police or police play a critical role in keeping our city safe. Um, and that's not to say that reforms aren't possible. We've been at the forefront of that conversation. We've been working very closely with the mayor of Newark on the CCRB, which is a civilian oversight review board. The review board, um, right. Yeah. So, so look, the, the police here in Jersey City have done a terrific job. And over the last several years, we've seen a historic decrease in crime. And that's in no small part because of the job that JCPD does every day. You know, people, um, you know, like to throw around a lot of expressions around defund the police or the police should be doing that or doing this. But, you know, in a given year, the JCPD takes 300 illegal guns off the street. Generally, they do that without an incident or a shot fired. And all of those 300 illegal guns, the holder or owner of them has uh, intentions of doing something illegal with them. Thus, it's an illegal gun. And uh, it's an amazing thing that the JCPD does every single year. They're not perfect, but uh, they're, they're really important to keeping the city safe. And we're going to continue to support them when they do right. And at the same time, do what we've been doing, which is, you know, uh, be a disciplinarian when they do wrong. Real quick before I let you go, Mayor. Um, the Jersey City Public Schools, will the students, we're taping on the 22nd of June, will your students be all in person in September? Look, it's an uh, autonomous uh, entity, obviously, the elected board of education. Schools, but elected board. board of education. Yeah, but, but the hope is yes. I, th I think that everybody wants to see them back in person, and uh, that's where learning happens. And the one thing we've seen over the last year is that the gap between the kids that have more resources uh, financially versus the kids that don't has only widened. So we need the schools back in person so that everybody can have the same opportunity to learn. You know what, Mayor, why don't we have you and your colleague and friend, Roz Baraka, the mayor of the great city of Newark together, <clears throat> not to debate population figures, but to talk about a whole yeah. range of issues you have in common and how you see the challenges that each one of you faces. Mayor, why don't we do that? Because you wind up talking behind each other's backs when you're on with me, and that's just not good. Look, I, I, I'd love to. He and I talk several times a week. We share a lot of ideas. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it, it would be a great thing to have that sort of conversation in person. Listen, by the way, for people who don't realize, I was joking. They do not talk behind each other's backs. Uh, Mayor Steve Fulop of Jersey City, thank you so much, Steve. Great, Thanks, great Steve. to have you with you. us again. I'm Steve Adubato. That's the mayor of Jersey City. See you next time. State of Affairs with Steve Adubato is a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding has been provided by the Turrell Fund, supporting Reimagine Child Care, New Jersey Sharing Network, the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, PNC, Grow Up Great, Holy Name Medical Center, Choose New Jersey, TD Bank, Rowan University, Operating Engineers, Local 825, 
and by these public-spirited organizations, individuals, and associations committed to informing New Jersey citizens about the important issues facing the Garden State, and by Employers Association of New Jersey. Promotional support provided by AM970 The Answer, and by NorthJersey.com and Local IQ, part of the USA Today Network. New Jersey's early educators and child care providers are more than twice as likely to live below the poverty line versus the general workforce. Reimagine Child Care, formed by a coalition in New Jersey, is dedicated to improving accessibility, affordability, and quality of child care and reimagining the way we support these essential providers. Learn more by visiting reimaginechildcare.org. 